Vessels large and small can sink or capsize with terrifying speed. That makes the prospect of abandoning ship something every vessel and every seaman must prepare for. Circumstances that may result in an abandoned ship crisis include collision, fire, foundering, grounding, hull failure, machinery failure, and weather-related emergencies. Because the sea is a hostile environment, Abandoning ship places crew members at extreme risk. Man overboard emergencies are equally dangerous. The threats to human life include drowning, hypothermia, dehydration, starvation, exposure, and hostile marine life. In most latitudes, the ocean is cold, and cold water quickly disables the unprotected human body. The colder the water, the greater the threat. But cold-related hazards like hypothermia exist even in seemingly mild conditions. A human body is at risk any time it is immersed in water capable of causing heat loss to outstrip heat production. Even in the tropics, an unaided individual's ability to swim or tread water is finite, so that the hazard posed by the ocean environment extends worldwide. To contend with these dangers, modern vessels carry substantial inventories of safety and survival gear and conduct regular drilling, training, and assessment operations. This program offers an overview of personal survival techniques in accordance with Table 6 of the STCW Code as amended in 1995. Lifeboat number two, all present and accounted for. It offers self-testing and assessment features that enable you to measure your knowledge and document your participation in your vessel's training, drilling, and assessment program. As you watch the videotape, keep in mind that your vessel may have additional policies and procedures that you must follow. Surviving a crisis at sea depends on knowledge, teamwork, and equipment. While equipment is vital, even the best gear is only as good as the people using it. That makes knowledge and teamwork the critical factors in survival at sea. Knowledge helps eliminate the mistakes and judgment that may spell the difference between life and death. Knowledge supports the will to survive, and strong will is a primary difference between those who make it and those who don't. Come down to the embarkation level. Training, drilling, and assessment operations are designed to ensure that you know how to use your vessel's safety and survival equipment properly and are capable of functioning as an effective member of an emergency response team. These operations are conducted for your benefit and the benefit of your crewmates. Their lives may depend on your decisions. Your emergency duties are identified on the station bills posted in prominent public spaces aboard the vessel and on the station card posted in your stateroom. Study these documents as soon as you join the vessel. Ask your supervisor to explain anything you don't understand. The station bill establishes the chain of command that will be followed during a crisis and assigns each crew member a station and a job. Survival is a team effort and every member of the team plays a role in the outcome of the emergency response. The officers aboard your vessel will rely on the assumption that you know your station and your job when emergency alarms are sounded. Don't let them down. The vessel's safety plan identifies the location of its safety and survival equipment. Shortly after boarding, you will receive familiarization training designed to acquaint you with the vessel and its safety program. If you still have questions, 
It's your right and your responsibility to study the safety plan, to inspect the vessel, and to query your supervisors until you understand your emergency duties. Personal survival equipment is generally stowed in individual staterooms. Inspect your gear immediately and make sure it fits and is in good condition. Ring buoys and water lights are positioned around the deck where they can be deployed immediately if someone falls overboard. Emergency communications and signaling equipment is positioned on the bridge. Firefighting and emergency breathing equipment are situated in the engine room. Embarkation deck lockers house gear that must be immediately accessible to the crew of a vessel in distress. Each vessel carries a complement of survival craft that may include inflatable life rafts, lifeboats, and fast rescue boats. Additional survival equipment ranges from search and rescue transponders and emergency position indicating radio beacons to pyrotechnic signals and thermal protective aids. We'll consider this equipment in detail later in the program. No one is ever 100% ready for an emergency at sea. Emergency situations always develop unexpectedly, and every situation is unique. Nearly all vessel casualties are the result of human error. In a crisis, making good decisions is the only thing that stands between the vessel and catastrophe. But fear and confusion can easily overwhelm good judgment. Because every emergency is different, there is no simple prescription for survival. Preparations that are sufficient for the Gulf of Mexico may be entirely inadequate for the Bering Sea, for example but the underlying objective is identical. The operator of the vessel has to ensure that the right gear is aboard and that it's properly stowed and serviced. The crew has to know how to use it. Installing, inspecting, and servicing equipment are tasks that must occur before the vessel leaves the dock. Once the vessel is at sea, regular training and drills are the only means of ensuring that the crew is ready to respond effectively to a crisis. 8 to 12, Q-man. Yeah. Hey. A crew that hasn't prepared in advance will probably make avoidable mistakes in a real emergency, while trained crews that survive crisis situations often state that it was just like a drill. While every emergency is unique, the seven steps represent a philosophy of sea survival that should help in any circumstance. Being aware that you're in danger is obviously the first step in coping with an emergency, but your mind may play tricks on you. The proximity of danger becomes routine for anyone who goes to sea, and that's a danger in itself. Whenever danger seems routine, it's easy to forget how serious the consequences of an accident or a mistake in judgment can be. Your mind may strive to minimize or ignore what your senses have perceived, but you've got to master disbelief. You've got to admit that you're in trouble soon enough to prepare an effective response. Don't let pride or panic keep you from calling for help and breaking out the survival gear. Responding quickly is the key to staying alive. What is the source of the danger? What shape is your crew in? And what equipment do you have to help cope with the emergency? If you're the vessel master or the leader of an emergency team, you've got to stand back for an instant and evaluate the crisis. If you're prepared, much of your equipment inventory will be staged and ready for use and your crew will know their jobs. Then, as the crisis evolves, you've got to constantly update your inventories. Have the dangers grown or diminished? Are there new hazards that complicate the emergency? Which crewmen are functioning well and which have been rendered helpless by injury or fear? What materials or supplies can be used to augment the survival gear? Cold is the killer in the northern and southern oceans, and you won't last very long without shelter. Water robs body heat much faster than air of the same temperature, so that exposure to cold water quickly disables someone who lacks adequate shelter. 
Your vessel is your best shelter as long as you can safely remain on board. When the vessel is no longer safe, personal flotation devices, immersion suits, and survival craft become the next best alternatives. But shelter isn't something to consider only in an emergency. Your everyday deck gear represents a vital form of shelter. You need layers of polypropylene or wool to keep you warm and waterproof foul weather gear that protects you from the wind and spray. Without good foul weather gear, you may get so wet and cold that you're hypothermic before you become the victim of an in-the-water emergency. Obviously, this reduces your chances of survival even further. Rescue at sea depends on alerting someone who can help you. Floating in a life jacket, you present two to four square feet of surface area, yet the pilot of a searching aircraft may be trying to find you within an area that measures tens of thousands of square miles. Unless you can draw the attention of rescue units, your chances may be almost zero. A signal is anything that makes you bigger, brighter, or different from your surroundings. A mayday, a mayday, a mayday. Your radio is your best signaling device because it makes you enormous and enables you to convey specific details about your location and condition. You should make a distress call as soon as you recognize that a potential emergency exists. We are sinking position 57. Two five north. When you lose radio contact, you have to depend on EPIRBs, SARTs, flares, strobes, flashlights, dyes, mirrors, your voice, anything that attracts attention. If you keep the bigger, brighter, different philosophy in mind, surprising objects can become effective signals. You need fresh water to stay alive and maintain the physical and mental strength necessary for coping with the ordeal of survival. Take as much fresh water as you can, but don't drink salt water, alcohol, or urine. We've got torches. We've got water. We have a the question of when and how much to drink depends on the circumstances of the emergency. In the tropics, rationing may be your highest priority, and any water you drink during the first 24 hours of the ordeal could simply be wasted in the form of perspiration or urine. In cold, harsh latitudes, you should consider drinking rationed quantities of water right away to preserve your strength and your faculties. The grim fact is that rationing for extended survival may not matter in an environment in which cold is a much more serious threat than thirst. You need high-energy food to maintain your strength but keep in mind that water is more important than food. Don't eat if you don't have water, because digestion robs water from your body. If you have adequate shelter and water, you can live a long time without food. If you do have both water and food, eat.